So while we're setting up, uh, let me just ask, how many people here primarily find their affiliation is with the art world? And how many with the science world? And how many can't be categorized in binary? <laughs> That's my first thing. <laughs> yeah. Let me introduce you, though. Okay. Let me, let me first tell you, this is Robert Hurd. He's a physicist and member of the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, which is uh, the acronym IPAC at California Institute of Technology. And he hosts a video podcast called The Hidden Universe and often speaks on the subject of using new media to communicate science and astronomy. Thank you, Steve. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as just kind of call back when we worked with Lido for the Observe ex exhibition years ago. It was a, always a delight to come up here and be involved with the activities here. So I'm here as an astronomer, but also as an illustrator and a uh, communicator to talk about how we see space. Uh, my job at IPAC is basically to head up the, uh, and oversee the visual side of science communication for astronomy and astrophysics. And I want to talk about how we look at space and how we use data to visualize the universe and understand it. So there are two parts to my talk, and the first will simply be using data as the source of imagery. And the nice thing is space is filled with stories, and stories is what we need to connect to people. So in many cases, just going to the raw data, we can uncover these incredible stories that, that, that will speak to us instantly when we see them, but can also be touched upon to tell us the deeper story, in this case, a region of space where gas clouds have come together and begun to form new stars that themselves begin to rip apart the dust clouds and the gas, creating these fantastic nebulae. There are other stories that we find out there, like when a, a massive star dies and uh, at the end of its life it explodes in a supernova. It casts out the outer layers, uh, creating the heavy elements that go back repopulate the universe. Now, you just look at the data and you see explosion. These, these stories are kind of embedded in the imagery. And this is actually very, very powerful for us. Uh, because we can use these pictures to help talk about the stories. But there's a lot that goes on behind how these images are done. Now, historically, our tool for understanding these stories, for seeing the universe, is of course the eye. Right? We, we look, we see, and we witness. But the eye is an amazing tool. It is capable of distinguishing a full spectrum of uh, color that, that makes all the images that you see. And yet, as powerful as the eye is, it only has access to a tiny fraction of the actual spectrum of light, right? The part that we call the visible spectrum, very arrogantly, of course, only maps onto our particular physiology, our particular set of Rones and cod. uh, cods. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Rods and cones, yeah. That, that, that see but red, green, blue. But there is an entire vast electromagnetic spectrum beyond the visible that we don't access directly with our eyes. And for that, we build artificialized telescopes that can go out and reach to the very highest energy of the spectrum, the gamma rays and the X rays, that can actually measure the very lowest energy into the spectrum, the infrared and all the way out to the radio. And this is all light. It's just light we don't happen to see. And part of my job is to take this light and render it back into colors we do understand. I like to think of it as translation process. You know, we don't, just like if you looked at a color is sometimes used. No, we're, I like to think we're remapping into a, a, a visual language we understand. So why do we do this? Well, if you just look at a galaxy in visible light, it's, it's fantastic. Now, of course, our eye would never even see this directly because our eyes isn't sense enough. So already, we have to build telescopes with large mirrors to collect more light than our eye is capable of. But here we see primarily the light of stars. We see a hint of dust lanes blocking some of our view of what's down there. But if we switch our view into other parts of the spectrum, into, say, the infrared, it's the same object, but it's a different story, a different narrative. The stars are still there in the blue haze that we see, but now the dust that used to be opaque is the thing that your eye goes to. The dust now glows, and we now see this spider webby filamentary structure that is telling us a deep narrative about how gas and dust are reprocessed constantly through the galaxy, providing the fuel that form new stars. We can keep changing our view. That same galaxy contains within it galleries of ways of looking at it, imagery, depending on how you pick and choose from the spectrum. Here we're actually starting with x-rays rendered as purple. We have ultraviolet light seen as blue, a visible light seen as yellow, infrared as red. 
And these all blend together and give us kind of a simultaneous story of the entire sort of spread of star formation from the dead stars to hot young stars to cooler stars and to the gas that, from which it all forms. Now, if we readjust our picture to look at, say, just infrared light, this is my personal specialty, is in the infrared part of the spectrum, uh, you can get to very interesting regimes, like pushed so far out into the infrared, starlight becomes lost. It's ephemeral, it's gone. You don't even see stars. <laughs> at this point, when you look at the Orion Nebula, one of the most beautiful images of nebulae in the sky, in the infrared, all you see is the dust. The stars are gone, they're ghosts. And you see the dust clouds that are intermingled with the gas that are beginning to form new stars. And the only hint of the connection is how the dust responds to the stars we can't see. It begins to glow. And this, the bluer temperatures are the hotter gas, the, the redder colors are the, the, the cooler gas and uh, the dust as it's forming. Another region I particularly love in the sky is the Rho Ophiuchus region. Uh, um, and again, anything that you see in this image that looks like a star is actually an illusion. It's not a star. That's a cloud of dust that's enshrouding a star that's in the process of forming at its core. One that's completely locked up and invisible in visible light, but in infrared, by looking at the dust it affects, we start to dig into its story of where stars come from. There are stories of other galaxies that we can look at. Sometimes they just stand on their own, I think, as works of art. Here, combining visible light from the Hubble Space Telescope with infrared light from the Spitzer Space Telescope, we see a story of a galaxy that's almost beautifully uniform and featureless, just dying in light, uh, the, the center part where all the stars are most densely clustered, with a single ring of gas and dust that very, very symmetrically encircles it. Uh, probably a remnant of some uh, long ancient merger between other dusty galaxies. There is uh, this picture of the, um, our neighboring Andromeda galaxy, here seen in ultraviolet light, light that's sensitive specifically to the, only the hottest, youngest stars, stars whose lifetimes are measured in millions of years, not billions, like our own sun, and are therefore all only found very close to the regions where they first form. We can even look at the familiar outside of the normal spectrum, and it becomes unfamiliar. Looking up at the sun, something that we normally think of as a completely uniform glowing disk with almost no structure except for the occasional sunspot. When seen in x-rays, it highlights a very, very asymmetric, energetic, and turbulent sun, not one that we access in visible light. And of course, sometimes the narratives are more creative than the science. Uh, if you look at the region around a dead star that's illuminating the, the nascent material surrounding it, uh, the story here might be the hand of God, but I promise you the actual science paper had nothing metaphysical in the uh, research. But sometimes the data isn't enough. Sometimes the data doesn't tell you everything you need to know. You look at a picture of the brightness of a star monitored over a course of time, you see during the gap of observation there is a disconnect in brightness. You can't look at that and deduce what was there. So we use art to help illustrate the missing information so that at a glance you have a better idea that in this case we have a story of a system that, while we were looking away, appears to have experienced a cataclysmic collision between objects that kicked out a fast dust cloud, causing it to light up in the infrared part of the spectrum. We can use the art to show us things that we simply don't have the perspective to see, like what our own Milky Way galaxy would look like if somehow we could actually push ourselves out of the plane and look down from above. The difference of trying to imagine what New York City looks like from Times Square versus from an airplane flying overhead as you're going in to land. And sometimes we use art to simply take us to places we will never be able to take a telescope to see. Uh, here, the idea of looking at a region around a black hole, accreting material that will eventually fall onto it and increase the size of the black hole. But the one little bit of matter that gets to escape that cataclysmic fate are the particles that get spun up around spiraling magnetic fields and spun up like, like beads on a string and whirled out at incredible speeds. Or even the most ridiculously unimaginable scenarios of looking beyond our universe to a possible multiverse of other universes all self-contained and the physics behind how such a multiverse might create slight visible traces when we look back to the earliest signs of our own universe but still trying to get across a narrative that would never be visible in the data set itself but probably the most compelling narrative i think for people is the idea of other earths other places we might find habitability water rocks and things that we identify with the world around us now, exoplanet data is generally not self-explanatory, especially if you're not a scientist. The little blips that you see in the light curves, the brightness of the star measured over time, each little dimming indicates the transit of a planet in front of the disk. 
Well, how we represent that as art it entails a certain amount of abstraction, right? We typically only know a few very isolated specific things for certain, especially after we first discover a system. There's a bunch of stuff we definitely know isn't true based on that little bit we know is true, but the gaps in between is where the interesting stuff happens. That's where you have the hypotheses, the possibilities. And so the role of the art, I think, is to come in there and find the things we know to be true, focus on that as much as possible, and choose, pick and choose from all the possibilities to fill in the gaps with all of the art that we think to create a complete picture that tells a narrative and engages people and draws them in. For instance, if we were to show the data from this TRAPPIST-1 system, a press release back from February, where we found seven Earth-sized planets in a single star system. And just to show exactly what we knew, it would be relatively uncompelling. You know, we know their sizes, and that's about it. But if we add to that the level of art, we can tell whole other narratives about what was going on in the system. The idea these planets might be tidally locked, with their same face always facing their star, thereby creating large temperature gradients and perhaps perpetually icy sides, not at the poles, but at the sides that never face the star. Now, as an astronomer trying to be an artist, I sometimes have to do my own research very non-scientifically, like what's the difference between wet water and frozen water on plastic, and playing with marbles on my, uh, my tabletop before I finally come up with a layout, I think will help us tell a story like the Trappist One system clearly, where um, we use for the cover of nature, where we're able to put in a lot of information, something that I hope has a certain fun appeal of a bunch of marbles on a desktop, but still it captures core bits of science, like the potential variety of planets in the system, the idea that they're tidally locked, the intrinsic color of this red, uh, uh, red dwarf star, which is actually more of an orange, uh, uh, sort of uh, warm, kind of like that kind of color temperature, and also getting into this concept of a habitability zone, a range of distances from the star where the temperature is, is just right, not, not too cold to be ice, not too hot to be vapor, and so encapsulating a lot of that into a single piece of art that you can sort of internalize and appreciate the story. So I'll just sort of wrap it up for my uh, minus 13 seconds. I'm sorry, I ran over by 15 seconds. And just say that we also produce animations and things to kind of continue to engage the audience, to draw people in, to help them imagine what it's like to be there, if, if they could be. And recognize that next year, we might have to redo this as we understand more and more about what the system's really like. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! So. <laughs>